Last episode, I made the skirt and overskirt of what could have been my great-great-grandmother Carolina's new best dress, the first thing she might have made for herself as a new immigrant to America in the spring of 1881. Now, I need to make the dress bodice. While it looks simple, everything from the fabric to the neckline would tell a person in the Victorian era about who my ancestor Carolina was. Fashionable dress bodices around this time sometimes had lower square-shaped necklines and three-quarter length sleeves, especially on someone's best dress. But Carolina was a Jewish girl from a tiny shtetl in what was then Hungary, and would be very orthodox in today's religious terms. While the shape of this dress is a very stylish American sort of cut, a low neckline or shorter sleeves wouldn't fit with her standards for dressing modestly. So this dress bodice has full length sleeves and a high neckline instead. I need to uh, do what's called flat lining, which is attaching the fabric that's gonna be the outside of the dress, the fashion fabric, to the interlining that's like sturdier and tougher and has the structure. The bodice is interlined with a firmer cotton twill. Still a lighter weight by modern standards, but definitely sturdy enough for a 19th century bodice. The pieces are nearly identical, except the fashion fabric has extra at the center front, so I can turn it to the inside for facing the button opening. You want to basically turn them into one piece of double layered material. Take an interlining piece and the corresponding fashion piece and just lay them flat on top of each other and base them together. It's called flat lining for a reason. Apparently, this was work that clothing producers, um, whether they were smaller contractor shops or factories, they would hire this work out to women in the Lower East Side, um, some, sometimes single women, sometimes married women. Because like this is really simple, it probably didn't pay very well and it was piecework. Like you would take it home and do it on your own time. This was considered like totally unskilled labor. Anybody can base. Children would be considered to be capable of doing this. But um, I've read accounts of families where for whatever reason, if the breadwinner was ill or injured or something was going on, someone had been widowed, um, something happened, and this would be the source of income. And it could be the source of income for an entire family. Literally just basting clothes together, not even sewing them, just getting them ready for other people to run through the sewing machine. And it made me think about how we discuss like low wage, low skill jobs today as being like, oh, well, it doesn't need to pay a living wage. Some teenagers just gonna do it for pocket money. In reality, a lot of times those jobs are being held by breadwinners. And it's this story we tell ourselves about who is doing a certain kind of work so we can justify what we pay for it or don't pay for it. It was piecework, you were paid by the piece. So the faster you worked, the more you got done, the more money you earned. They would be doing this, literally just basting pieces together as fast as you could. And that was paying your family's rent, your family's bills, and the faster you were at it, the more likely that was to, to make ends meet for you. So you would have to be a lot better and faster at this than I am. Like on the skirt, the four bodice starts are basted with a ladder stitch, going back and forth through the marked lines. When I pull the thread, the dart folds closed in the perfect shape, and it's much easier to machine sew. Before I do any machine sewing, though, I need to check the fit. It mostly fits. I don't know what's going on with this wrinkling here. And it's happening on this side, too, where the dart has stayed in place. So it looks like it's a needing to be taken in sort of situation. Like if I just pinch out a little bit more fabric, take most of that width out of the uh, side piece here, rather than the, the front. So then the front seam comes over this way, and this sits a little bit more smoothly over my hip and the pad. This video is sponsored by Seed, who are on a mission to establish probiotics as a science. 
and to bring much needed precision, efficacy, and education to the global category of probiotics. What I love about Seed's products and their attitude is that they don't do the sort of misleading cure-all wellness marketing we see so often. Seed's DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic is a probiotic and prebiotic in one, using a capsule and capsule via cap to make sure the probiotics are actually survive their journey through your digestive system, which is the whole point of a probiotic. It comprises 24 scientifically validated probiotic strains which support systemic benefits, including digestive, heart, and skin health. The prebiotic is patented and non-fermenting, so less likely to cause discomfort. DSO-1 is free from a really long list of things, which I'll put up on screen. If you avoid shellfish, dairy, corn, gluten, sugar, soy, sesame, peanuts, or all animal products, you can have these. Longtime viewers will know that taking care of my health is really important to me. I have this big scoliosis curve in my spine, as well as fibromyalgia, so a load of chronic pain and fatigue. Probiotics do not treat those, but the better I look after my overall health, the more resilient I am when it comes to dealing with my chronic issues. Seed makes it easy to include probiotics in my routine. DSO-1 doesn't require refrigeration, so I can store it with my morning medications and take it at the same time. And their month supply refills are shipped directly to me in sustainable packaging. I'm happy to have a high quality probiotic in my routine and to get them from a company that doesn't treat probiotics like snake oil. Seed is offering my viewers 30% off their first month's supply of the DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic with my code SNAPPYDRAGON. There's a link in the description. Ashkenazi Jews are people prone to tummy issues, so if we ever figure out time travel, maybe I'll send some of these back to great-great-grandma Carolina. I'm starting by machine sewing the darts, since those don't need any adjustments. But before I do any more, I need to base the fit adjustment on the side seams. All of the uh, width that I'm taking out is coming out of the uh, side piece. So that means I have to adjust the line rather than just pinching it and pulling the whole seam in like that. It's a little tricky, but has to be done or it'll be hard to sew such a dramatic curve on the machine. Then I can get on with the rest of the bodice construction. Side front seams, side back seams, center back seam, and shoulder seams. You always feel like by the time I get a dress bodice to this phase, um, like the construction goes almost unfairly quickly. But usually by the time you've got to the point of running it through the machine, like you've done all the hard work and now it's just, put together. There it is. Okay, let's just pin the outsides of these sleeves together. The sleeves are a two-piece coat style, the standard for Western fashion in the 1880s. They're not flatlined since they don't need the additional structure that flatlining gives. However, they will get a regular lining in cotton muslin, assembled the exact same way. All the seams are pressed open to prevent uncomfortable lumpiness when the sleeves are on. I've got regular sleeve, um, corresponding sleeve in the muslin lining, and I'm going to sew them together uh, right side to right side at the wrists. Then turn them inside out. I actually don't know how accurate of a lining method this is, but it's a major time saver and covers all the raw edges and then set them in in one go. The sleeve head is bigger than the armhole, so two rows of gathering stitches are added at the top of the shoulder. 
match up that notch with the seam it's supposed to go to and flip it. From there, I can pull in the gathering stitches until the sleeve is the right size, then slowly and carefully sew the sleeve with its lining onto the bodice. Now that the bodice is all assembled, it's time for a good pressing before all the finishing work. I'm using a long pin as a binding maker to iron under both edges of long strips of muslin. Don't try putting your iron down like this until you know exactly how much your ironing board can take. Those strips are sewn onto the bodice at seam allowances to form channels. Fitted 19th century bodices like this nearly always had lightweight boning in the seams for more structure. The darts also get boning channels, but these have to be sewn on by hand so the stitches only go through the flat lining layer. I need to put boning, which is synthetic whalebone, in those channels I just sewed. This is super flexible. This is more flexible than my fingernails. And all it's gonna do is stop the bodice crinkling up on itself because it's so closely fitted. It's synthetic whalebone. Back in the day, they would have used the real stuff, but we no longer act as though whales are an infinitely renewable resource. Now it's just hand finishing left. The open ends of all the channels are sewn shut and the neckline and bottom edges are finished with wide strips of fabric. These are cut on the bias so they'll stretch around the curves. I did a lot of this in the evenings, which is appropriate to how Carolina would do it, but probably not after Shabbat dinner, which is exactly what I am doing. I was about to do the buttonholes on this and I realized the only buttonhole thread I have that goes with this fabric is silk. And that just did not seem right to me. So I did something very in keeping with the theme of this project. Um, and I walked to a neighbor's house and borrowed the right thread from a friend who lived nearby. So I have this off-white pearl cotton buttonhole twist, not silk, not as expensive. Machine buttonhole makers did exist and had existed from like the 1860s. They were separate machines. While this was something that if Carolina was working in a factory, they might've had one there. She would not have been able to use that for her personal projects, no way. The upshot is I don't see her having access to the sort of technology that would have enabled her to put machine done buttonholes on this dress. Thus, I am sewing 19 tiny buttonholes by hand. These tiny metal buttons are antiques from the 19th century. I don't know much about them other than that, but they have a tiny Star of David stamped into them and I couldn't resist. They're sewn on by hand with a doubled length of that same buttonhole thread. And the bodice is done. I'd never made anything of this style or time period before, certainly not from a pattern I drafted myself. I am so, so happy with how it's come out. The fit's not absolutely perfect, but it's pretty close. There's like a little bit of wrinkling here and a little bit of extra room in the chest from my shoulders sitting forward when they should sit further back. I can move easily in it. It's so cool to actually see it, even if I'm definitely wearing jeans under this right now. Next episode, you'll finally get to see Carolina's entire outfit in some extremely exciting surroundings. Subscribe so you don't miss that when it premieres. Tell me in the comments what you think it would feel like to wear your ancestors' clothes. And click the link in the description for 30% off your first month's supply of the DS01 Daily Symbiotic with my code SNAPPYDRAGON, courtesy of this video's sponsor, Seed. I'll see you next time. Bye!